V8. My friends called it the rocket. It was incredible. I started writing and taking girls on dates with the money that I earned. Most importantly, I wrote every day, at first for the kids, my clients, but eventually for myself. And I have been writing every day since. I was 23 years old when I finally made it to college. I was 29 when I became an elementary school teacher, and I was 35 when I published my first novel. I've been teaching elementary school now for 17 years. I've published three novels, and I have a fourth coming out in September. The last one was translated into more than 20 languages, and it was an international bestseller. All of my novels have been optioned for film and television. None of this would have happened without Mr. Campo in that day in December of 1988. And here's the thing. He didn't do it through curriculum. He didn't do it through any best practices. He didn't do anything that he learned in teacher's college, and he didn't do anything that his department head advised him to do. In fact, what he did was inadvisable. He shouted with a kid in front of a class. <laughs> he made a bet, and the wager was a grade. <laughs> he risked his reputation. He risked his authority. He gave me a chance to win at his expense, and I suspect he knew I was going to win that day. Mr. Campo knew something that all great teachers know, that curriculum <laughs> does not change lives. Teachers change lives. Curriculum. <laughs> Thanks. Curriculum is nothing more than the ingredients that a chef uses to make an amazing meal. And although it's good to start with quality ingredients, we all know that a master chef can take almost anything and prepare a great entree. We've all seen Bobby Flay on TV take like bacon bits and mayonnaise and some cardboard and somehow make an entree <laughs> that we all want to eat. And then there's chefs like me. I can have the finest ingredients in the world, and in the end, I will produce something that tastes a little bit like bacon bits and mayonnaise and cardboard. <laughs> Curriculum does not change students. Teachers do. And most of the time, it's teachers who are audacious and daring and different and perhaps a little bit crazy. I think we've forgotten that in America today. If you think about the predominant topic of conversation in education today, it is curriculum. It is common core. We have somehow decided that the what is more important than the how. We have somehow decided that it is more important to look at what we teach kids instead of how we can reach their hearts and their minds. And this is not a criticism of Common Core. I am not taking a stand either way on it. I am taking a stand on talking about curriculum. I want us to shut up about it and talk about the things that really matter. I want to talk about teachers. I don't think that it's going to make a damn bit of difference how a kid divides fractions, or the books that they read, or the way they engage in the scientific method, none of those things are going to change their futures. The great teachers know that. They know that the lessons that you teach, the bigger, broader lessons are the ones that count. Mr. Campo could have been teaching me basket weaving or Martian philosophy, and he still would have changed my life that day. Let me prove it to you. I want you to think about a time in your life, your Mr. Campo moment, the time in class when someone did something to you or something happened in a classroom and your life changed forever. It went in a new direction, or you found a new passion, or for the first time in your life you decided to work. Did it have anything to do with curriculum? Did it even have anything to do with the subject that you were studying at the time? I've asked this question to hundreds of people and the answer is always the same. Like most of you in the room, we can attach the greatest moments of our lives in classrooms not to subjects, but to teachers, to names. For me, Mrs. Schultz, sixth grade. Lester Maroney, grades nine through 12. Russ Arnold, grade 11 and 12. Patrick Sullivan, my sophomore year of college. The late Hugh Ogden, my senior year of college. And Mark Campopiano, senior year of high school. Those are the people who have changed my lives and it had nothing to do with the subjects they were teaching. In fact, their subjects, algebra, French, the bassoon, public speaking, poetry, and English. All of them made a difference, and it didn't matter what they were teaching me. Mrs. Schultz played Dungeons and Dragons with me during her lunch hour. We listened to Toto, which was her favorite band of the time. And she taught me that it is OK to be different as long as you're being yourself. That is the greatest lesson I've ever been taught, and it is the one that I carry closest to my heart. And it had nothing to do with curriculum. Lester Maroney, my French teacher, in my first year called me Dickus. 
And in my second year, when my brother arrived at high school, I became Big Dickus, <laughs> and my brother became Little Dickus. <laughs> Lester Maroney gave me 87 consecutive detentions, which according to him is a school record. <laughs> and he used every one of those detentions to play chess with me and to lecture me on the importance of self-motivation until that lesson sunk into my bones. Russ Arnold handed me a bassoon and dared me to fail. He taught me the value of hard work, but more importantly, he taught me that hard work is supposed to be hard. It's not going to be fun, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Patrick Sullivan taught me that I was a leader. He made me president of the National Honor Society without asking me. <laughs> he told me that I was an idiot if I didn't run for class president. And if I think about the man that I'm still trying to be, that model that I have is Pat Sullivan. He's always been the person I'm striving for. The late Hugh Ogden saw a guy walk into poetry class very nervous. He's not a poet. He sat next to me. He rubbed my back and called me honey while his dog <laughs> sat on my foot. And he convinced me that I belonged. He taught me that I belonged wherever I thought I belonged. And Mark Campopiano made me a writer. But more importantly, he made me a teacher. He gave me my future. Because when he changed my life that day, I decided to become a teacher, and now I had something to look forward to. I take the lessons of those people into my classrooms every day, and I try to be like them. I try to be audacious and daring and different and just a little bit crazy. Ten years ago, I had a student who I was worried about. He wasn't working. He wasn't focused. Frankly, all he was doing was playing video games. And so I made an unannounced visit to his house one day with the social worker. While the social worker was talking to his grandmother, I went upstairs to his bedroom. I put in a desk that I had stolen from my school in the corner. <laughs> I put in a lamp and some papers and some pencils. And then before I left his room, I went behind his TV and I pulled the power cords out of the three video game systems he had in his room. And I did not give those power cords back until the end of the year. <laughs> there is nothing in the curriculum about stealing furniture from the school <laughs> and bringing it to a kid's class. And it is inadvisable to walk into a kid's house and steal stuff that's his. <laughs> but it is exactly what Mr. Campo would have done for me. Five years ago, I was teaching fifth grade, and I needed my students to learn more Shakespeare than any class before or since. I challenged them, if you do this, I will let you throw snowballs at me. They worked harder than any kids you have ever <laughs> seen. And when they met my goal on a February day, I stood against a brick wall while they lined up ready to fire. <laughs> What I didn't know was that during recess they had dug a trench and they had lined that trench with ice balls. The rule was you could not throw at my head, but these 10-year-olds had no intention of throwing at my head. They were targeting a far more sensitive part of my anatomy. <laughs> they dropped me like a sack of potatoes. They still come back and see me and the two things they remember are Shakespeare and ice balls. Shakespeare is not in my curriculum, and I've taught it every year that I have been teaching. And it is inadvisable to have kids throw snowballs at you, but it is exactly the kind of thing Mr. Campo would have done for me. Last month, I ran my annual Make Mr. Dicks Cry writing contest. It's simple. You write something in the contest, and you're trying to make me cry. The deal is I will read it aloud to the class while you record me, and if you actually make me cry, I will take that recording and post it to YouTube. In five years, no kid has ever come close to making me cry until last month. Julia Hosick wrote a piece about the death of her grandfather and all the losses that she foresaw in her future because he wasn't there anymore. And she cheated because as I read, she began to weep first. <laughs> and then I started to cry. And if you go to my YouTube channel, <laughs> You will find that video under the heading that Julia chose, which was, even a fifth grader can make a dumb, stupid, old teacher cry. <laughs> Julia told me that she will never forget that moment in her life. And her mother emailed me the next day and thanked me for convincing Julia that she could do anything if she put her mind to it. There is nothing in my curriculum about teaching kids to write stuff that makes people cry. And it is inadvisable to let kids publish things mean about teachers on their own YouTube channels. <laughs> but it's exactly what Mr. Campo would have done for me. There is 
nothing wrong with curriculum. And it's good to have good curriculum. But if I had the choice between a great teacher or a great curriculum, I choose the teacher every time. And if we're going to really be honest about it, I choose the great teacher and no curriculum. I find the person who's passionate about anything. I make sure that they are audacious and daring and different and perhaps a little bit crazy.